Speculative fiction, from the most fantastic science fiction to the bleakest dystopia, shines a light on current issues and the reality we know in the here and now. Today's guest uses narrative as a laboratory about governance, political violence, and even what it means to be American. He's Christopher Brown this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University in beautiful Newport, Rhode Island. Alongside me, as always, is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. So each week, we sit down with authors, scholars, filmmakers, and more to understand the role narrative plays in American public life. This week, we're joined by Christopher Brown, an incredibly talented writer whose first novel, Tropic of Kansas depicts a fractured United States in the aftermath of another civil war. Chris, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for us. having me. So let's talk a little bit about your novel. Uh, Tropic of Kansas, it's received wide praise. Without giving anything away, tell us a little bit about the novel itself. Tropic of Kansas is a, it's a story about two people caught up in a revolution in the United States in kind of a dark mirror version of the world we live in. It follows a, the, uh, a, a young fugitive, sort of the orphaned uh, child of political dissidents, uh, and kind of a Rip Van Winkle uh, story as he's deported back to the U.S. Uh, on the other side of a, a, the can Canadian border wall, and uh, is uh, then pursued by his uh, sister, who's coerced to uh, follow him through a kind of a barren heartland, a kind of a, a mid-America that's gone a little third world. And uh, they're seeking, you know, kind of refuge and sanctuary, and uh, and seeking a kind of a, a a more hopeful future. And the story follows them as they try to get there. What um, when you when you when you're writing a, a dystopian novel like this, are you beginning from well, where do you begin? What how do you uh, craft the dystopia in your own mind? Uh, I mean, to me, a well-written dystopia is really just a remix of the observed world. Uh, science fiction can, can be practiced using the same tools of naturalism as great literary fiction and Tropic of Kansas is really a kind of a, a, a report on the world I see out there as I travel through uh, the United States especially the kind of the, the, the parts where I live between Minnesota and Texas and uh, and uh, and then kind of looking at it through a kind of a funhouse mirror if you will it's sort of a Dystopia is a kind of a, or science fiction generally, is a kind of a tool for inverting the world around us and sort of maybe doing a remix, emphasizing certain elements in an effort to better understand kind of what's really going on uh, beneath the kind of the surface of daily life. And were there particular truths that you wanted to get at with Tropic of Kansas that, that, that are in the novel? I mean, it ended up that way. It started out, I simply wanted to imagine, uh, a kind of play with a counterfactual, which was, uh, what if the revolutions we see happening on the other side of the world were happening right here? We're sort of happening outside our office windows and on the streets outside of our homes. And, you know, stories of revolution are a very big part of uh, American narrative. We have I live in Texas, and I have both, I, I, my 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 kid grew up with both the revolution, the revolutionary creation myths of our country and of my own state, and uh, they're lurking out there in the subtext of a lot of our contemporary public debates, um, and uh, and so I wanted to explore that, and then in the process of that, I kind of came across all of these other issues about uh, looking at things like uh, how our relationship with the bountiful uh, uh, land on which we live, sort of. Uh, uh, influence indirectly influences a lot of our social and economic problems. Looking at issues of kind of inequality and imminent plutocracy and things like that. So, in hearing you describe the book, and I haven't read it, but I am definitely going to read it. And I'll I've read it. it's phenomenal. I'm going to review it for the Providence Journal too. I'll tell you that. 
I hear a lot of echoes of 2017 and certainly the election year of 2016. Now, I'm assuming you began writing this obviously before this year. When did you begin writing it? And was this just like dumb luck that a lot of the themes that you're hitting are, are themes in the real world today in some form or another that resonate? Yeah, well, I, 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 I started writing it in 2012, late 2012. And I finished it right around uh, Thanksgiving of 2014. Um, and in the process of sort of the world building, as, as, as we call it in science fiction, of imagining this kind of uh, mirror version of America, uh, I invented things like, uh, hey, what if we had a, 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 a CEO turned president? So I have a sort of charismatic businessman who becomes like a fascist president. Uh, and uh, I have a lot of kind of very divided factionalization of the country with, you know, roaming bands of Carhartt militias rounding people up and uh, uh, kind of a fierce anti-immigrant uh, intensity. And uh, those things were more of a function of just reporting on what I was seeing around me. I mean, the idea of the CEO president and the kind of authoritarian figure that that represents is not a new idea. It's been kicking around since the 80s, and you can see it in uh, the, the several of the prior political candidates without getting into uh, specifics. But let's so pick up on that thread for a second because the you've worked in your in your in your day job, if you were. You are an attorney who works uh, in the tech sector. Uh, you've worked with CEOs. The CEO model uh, is not a democratic model. Uh, it is an authoritarian model. Uh, and uh, you you wrote recently about. Uh, um, the myth of the outsider CEO uh, being debunked uh, in the business community. You wrote, the charismatic CEO model is ascendant in our politics despite having been discredited on Wall Street. Management scholars like Harvard's Rakesh Kurhana have cogently argued that co contrary to conventional wisdom, outsider CEOs pursuing, quote, organizational transformation tend to leave the enterprise crippled while enriching themselves and resisting all limits on their power. So why is our politics still enmeshed and you know, enamored with the idea, the myth of the CEO executive? I don't know if I can entirely answer that question, but I think that, that it's reflexively intuitive, the idea that you know, one, a great qualification to run a country would be to run a big company. Uh, it's an archetype of success we've built up over, especially over the last kind of 40 years. Uh, it's one that I don't think we often interrogate with a lot of rigor. Uh, uh, we sort of valorize, you know, we have the sort of CEOs who are the kind of the uh, cover magazine, you know, celebrities of a certain uh, segment of our culture, a culture in which we all think of ourselves as investors, or a lot of us do. And, uh, but, uh, and we, we like authority figures, you know. I mean, we're a democracy, but we also gravitate towards, uh, you know, uh, individual authority figures, and you can see that uh, in our politics in every presidential election. We're looking for that strong leader figure, and uh, we've been drifting over the years into a greater and greater emphasis on that. Uh, and uh, if you extrapolate it out, if, if you've ever worked in a corporation, if you've ever worked on a CEO, you know that a, a corporation isn't a democracy, it's a dictatorship in which the CEO, you know, uh, control there there isn't even any free speech and uh, everybody's ideas are owned by the company and uh, the idea of modeling how we run our country off that to me is a sort of a troubling one and that's why I thought it was interesting to play with that in the you know speculative prism of science fiction this is your first novel but it's certainly not your first writing uh, you've had a very varied and interesting career writing fantasy shorter fiction I'm assuming that would mean uh, and also, as a lawyer, and I'm, I'm looking at some of your biography, biography here, you've co-hosted a punk rock radio show, built an eco-bunker, worked day labor, negotiated hundreds of technology deals, raised an amazing kid, and trained a few good dogs. Let's talk craft for a minute. How do you bring that life experience into writing a novel? I mean, What do you draw on? And, and then I want to get into sort of your daily regime and, and routine, rather, but how do you work all that in? I mean, I'm trying to write character-driven science fiction. I'm interested in marrying uh, sort of literary naturalism with the literature of ideas, as it were, uh, one in which you uh, play with the context of 
You know, in a literary novel, you might take a family and say, what happens to the relationships in that family if some sort of problem occurs? This is sort of widening the aperture uh, to look at what happens to the collective family of society if you change the kind of political or social or ecological framework. So, but, so I'd start with a you know, character-driven story, and uh, you, know, you sort of establish the characters, and you establish the situation, and you try to follow them into that uh, setup you've created, and do it with fidelity to the things you've seen in, the, in your own real life and in the real lives of the people you know, and, uh, and trying to you know, apply empathy to understand people who have very different experiences from your own. Uh, that's kind of the biggest challenge and the most important undertaking of this kind of writing and trying to tell, you know, kind of for me, real American stories uh, in a sort of slightly upside down version of the so, world. So is creation of character the fundamental when you're writing a novel? Compa absolutely, absolutely. Compared to the I mean, narrative or the, or the setting, whatever, it sounds like I'm hearing you say that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of science fiction as a branch of realism. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's no accident that a lot of our greatest sort of literary writers gravitate towards science fiction and towards dystopian fiction as a, as a mode to accurately depict the world we live in. You know, I mean, 10 years ago, the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction went to a post-apocalyptic cannibal novel, one that was written by, you know, Cormac McCarthy, one of our most esteemed uh, uh, writers, and... Uh, you know, why would this paragon of kind of post-Hemingway, post-Faulkner realism choose that mode to tell the story? I think because it accurately depicted, it was the best way to accurately depict what it felt like in certain respects to be alive in the dark years of the war on terror when there's all this sort of very bleak stuff going on in the kind of just off stage of our lives. and. Uh, why did you know Margaret Atwood chose to choose to write The Handmaid's Tale? Because not because it exactly depicted the world around her, but it depicted things that kind of wanted to happen. And so, uh, trying to undertake that kind of uh, uh, literary project, I think, is a worthwhile thing. So, so it's really it, it's an effort, you know, sort of in the grander sense to understand us, meaning society, meaning America, meaning the world today. Yeah, and to uh, understand uh, where we're going. Um, that's the other great potential of uh, science fiction and of you know, the speculative genres of fiction. Um, uh, the English writer J.G. Ballard uh, liked to say that you know, we already live in a world ruled by fictions uh, of every kind where politics has become practiced as a branch of advertising and we each kind of now in the age of network culture sort of get to curate our own version of reality. Uh, and so the sort of the, the project of the writer is to kind of invent the real reality that exists and to kind of convey it and to maybe imagine uh, sort of better and more hopeful futures when we're going through what often seem to me like dark times. Well, and so you, you, you expounded on this a little bit in a recent essay on LitHub uh, where you described that the, the, the purpose of dystopian fiction isn't just to create, create craft this, this, this ugly future. Uh, or this ugly present, it's to actually perhaps identify those alternative, those better alternatives. Yeah. Is there are, are there better alternatives uh, that you w w that you would draw from the Tropic of Kansas? Well, uh, the Tropic of Can in Tropic of Kansas, I uh, yeah, I mean, I think I sort of wrote my way into uh, a point where I may not have found utopia, but. I felt like you could kind of see the better future at the end. It certainly, I try to find my way to a more hopeful uh, uh, vision of an American society, trying to imagine, you know, what does American democracy look like in the 21st century? Does the sort of mode of structuring our politics that we invented in 1789, based on uh, the sort of social and technological conditions of that age, uh, is it maybe ready for a little bit of an update? You know, what does democracy look like in, a, in the age of Facebook in a sort of totally networked world? So the book tries to deal with those issues. Uh, what does American society need to look like when we no longer have an unlimited bountiful frontier uh, to exploit, uh, when the climate is increasingly exhausted? How do we need to rethink the relationship we have with the land on which we live, which is such a 
kind of root cause of a lot of our social and economic inequalities and uh, injustices. And, uh, and so, yeah, I think I found my way to sort of maybe to the, to the lip of the cup there. Um, and, uh, and I'm hoping to explore that further in future work. Well, let's take a quick moment for station identification. This is Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. If you're enjoying an audio version of the show, you're listening to Sirius XM Satellite Radio, where we can be heard three times each weekend on the popular Politics of the United States. That's the POTUS Channel 124. You can also download this week's episode at any time on the Sirius XM app. Story in the Public Square is produced by a crew of tremendous professionals at Rhode Island PBS. We're grateful to be able to work with them. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University in historic and beautiful Newport, Rhode Island. If you want to catch up with me on Twitter, I'm at J.M. Lutis. My co-host in this enterprise is G. Wayne Miller, an award-winning and accomplished author of 17 books and journalist with the Providence Journal. He tweets at G. Wayne Miller. Finally, our guest this week is Christopher Brown, author of the remarkable dystopian novel, Tropic of Kansas. If you want to catch up with him on Twitter, he's at NB, that's Nancy Bravo, underscore Chris. Uh, so Chris, uh, you spent uh, uh, part of your life working in the United States Senate. I did. Uh, I'm wondering, not just the Tropic of Kansas, but how did that experience working uh, in the Senate uh, shape your literary exploits? Did it exploit your literary exploits? Well, yeah, I mean, on a lot of different levels it did. Um, and, uh, you know, there was n few few experiences in my life were more science fictional than eating deep dish, pe eating deep dish pizza with Strom Thurmond, you know, in the ante room of the, of the Senate caucus room during the Clarence Thomas hearings. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, I think there's at least a, a short story. <laughs> to yeah, come out it's, of that. it's uh, <laughs> and a true story than one that, that's sort of equal parts William Burroughs and uh, and Cormac McCarthy maybe. <laughs> it uh, you know working around power really has impacted the things I want to write. I've worked around political power, uh, you know, sitting there in the cloakrooms of the, off the Senate floor and seeing how those uh, people conduct themselves, our elected officials. And I've worked around corporate power and kind of the boardrooms of public companies. And, um, and, you know, and there's a tension between power, especially the power that accretes in individuals or the power that accretes in discrete institutions, and living in a democratic and egalitarian society. And so uh, in my storytelling, I'm interested in exploring those issues uh, yeah, through through a sort of humanist prism, through telling very human stories about what the experiences of living in that world, and particularly of like in this book, it's about looking at trying to look at that world through the point of view of people who are not in positions of power, uh, people who are really kind of disenfranchised by the structure of that society. And while it's a sort of a uh, you know, an extravagantly imagined world in one respect. It's also one that I think it's trying to at least tell a lot of truths about how the country we live in really works. You've had a very, very rich life experience. And so in your writing, you could have gone one of two ways. You could have decided to write nonfiction and maybe you have done some of that. But in terms of your first book, you chose fiction. Why, what can you do in fiction that you can't do or that you can do better in fiction that you can't do in nonfiction. Why, why go this route? You, you well, you can have a lot more fun. <laughs> uh, and that is exactly what I was hoping you would say, because it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's absolutely true. Yeah, and you can, uh, you can, you pull people into an engaging story uh, and then let that story kind of uh, lead them into looking freshly at, at the world around them and at their own lives. And I think, I think uh, it can do many of the things that nonfiction does, but in a much more engaging way, in a way that also allows a lot more room for sort of artistic play and, um, and uh, yeah, and a lot more fun. And uh, I, think it's, I think it can be an, a, a remarkably effective thing. Can, can, you, can you tell truths or certain truths better in fiction? Yeah, because so, you can you can you can critique things that uh, you know you can examine things that if you examine them in a non-fictional way would be very very politically provocative, uh, and um, and in a way that would 
you know, put off certain people sort of reflexively in the way that, you know, we're all sort of acclimated now to only read the opinions of those with whom we agree, right? And it can help you see, it can help you see things kind of more clearly in the way that, uh, uh, you know, it's a kind of an inversion. It's like, uh, you know, it's like the anatomy student when you sort of, you know, dissect the ca cadaver and turn it inside out, you're still looking at the same body, but from a different point of view that lets you see it differently. And this is a kind of a variation on that. You, uh, so the, the Tropic of Kansas is set in a, well, obviously a dystopian future, but there, there, there is in, in a, in a, in a post-Civil War America, there are a lot of novels, uh, particularly the last 20, 30 years that have imagined another, a second American Civil War. Many of those are written, though, from uh, a more right-leaning political perspective, uh, imagining uh, uh, sort of a cleanse this blood with, a cleanse this land with blood sort of uh, view of contemporary American society. Uh, there's a recent uh, review article of your book on The Intercept where Brendan Byrne situates Tropic of Kansas in that universe. What was your take on his uh, his description of you in that universe of other uh, new Civil War literature? I thought it was pretty spot on. I mean, Brendan Byrne is a sharp writer, and um, uh, I think that uh, I, I was absolutely intending to sort of work with that material of American narratives of revolution and sort of repurpose it towards more emancipatory ends, if you will. And, uh, and also to kind of play with the tropes of adventure fiction and action adventure stories and uh, that are so prevalent uh, in the culture and kind of shift them into a different direction. Uh, I mean, stories of revolution are lurking right below the, they're kind of the third rail of American politics, in my opinion. I mean, they're out there in 2017. They're, sure. It's kind of the, you know, it's the not even subtext of the Second Amendment debate is this idea that there's a, you know, fundamentally there's this other document in, that precedes the Constitution called the Declaration of Independence, which is a manifesto of revolution. Right. We don't really ever, you know, the first thing they teach you in law school is that doesn't count now. <laughs> right? we, want, we want revolution to kind of keep its powdered wigs on, but I think... I think you have to look at that. I mean, we have several states that even have like rights of revolt written into the Constitution. And, and I think if we don't kind of bite into that copper wire and sort of look at it and, and explore the, the kind of the, the social and other like political pressures that are sort of gravitating around that, I think we do ourselves a disservice. So let me, I've been looking through reviews this book has gotten, and it's gotten really an astounding number of really, really good reviews. I'm going to just read a couple, or snippets from a couple. Booklist said, Cormac McCarthy meets Philip K. Dick. Very high praise. NPR said, Tropic of Kansas is like a modern dystopian bullet. And the Times Literary Supplement said, richly imagined. So clearly you're connecting to, to critics and to readers. You left out too, the feel bad book of the year. I forgot. To do that. <laughs> I'm trying to keep this on an uplifting note, but but obviously you've engaged readers and critics, so you have entertained, you have provided a, a quality literary product, something that potentially could even be a movie. But beyond that, beyond the experience of reading it, what do you want people to take away from this? Do you want them to think, quote unquote, deeper? Do you want them to think more about our own society, not a dystopian society imagined in fiction? What would you hope, you know, sort of from a, a public or a citizen point of view? I mean, I'm not, I'm not here to dictate to a reader what, you know, how they want to experience, a, you know, a, a text or a story or an artistic work. Uh, but I would hope that um, they would find it an extremely engaging story that they would want to finish. Uh, and I would hope that when they were done, it would stick with them and cause them to kind of see the world around them through a fresh lens uh, to see the little kernels of dystopia or other manifestations of, uh, of uh, kind of injustice that are already, mm -hmm. you know, we're all walking by or driving by every day and to think about, uh, you know, the project that our politics is largely abandoned and has been left to the purview of the wonky purview of science fiction writers, which is trying to imagine 
what does a more hopeful future look like? You know, it used to be that we had, you know, utopian and kind of pragmatic uh, uh, dipoles in our political narratives and in our social narratives. And I, I don't feel like we have so many of those hopeful futures now. But, and I'm looking, for, I hope people will help us find one. But I think it's important to note, you, 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 you did not begin this, uh, this, this, this book does not come off as like you're, you're pushing a political agenda. No. Uh, and that's something that you took pains to avoid. Is that, is that something Absolutely. To say? I'm just trying to tell a story about people wandering through a, uh, wandering through a landscape that's uh, basically the slightly distorted version of the one I, one I see around me. So we often talk craft with our writers uh, and something I love to do. We don't have enough time to get into this in any great detail. But you write in a unique place. We have not had a writer on this show who writes in an airstream. Tell us quickly about that, why, and I saw pictures of it back in the, in the green room. It looks really cool. If yeah, I, I, have a, I have a 1978 Airstream land yacht that I, <laughs> that I bought in the nadir of the financial crisis uh, after it had been roaming the country with some fellow from Northern Virginia who left some things in there, including, <laughs> including some outstanding uh, mid-70s uh, eight-track tapes of country music. Uh, but yeah, I have, uh, so I, I, I repurposed that as a, uh, as a, as a permanently installed uh, sort of hut in the front yard as a place to work. And uh, I both practice uh, law out of there and, uh, really? and uh, uh, practice my career as a, as a writer. And uh, it's, a, it's a sort of a wonderfully atemporal uh, milieu in which to, uh, to try to uh, kind of tell stories and, and, and think about different views on the world. You know, those things, they have those, uh, the sort of the, the, the lines of, uh, you know, of like a World War II bomber somehow translated through like 60s and 70s Detroit uh, assembly line. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good place. It to sounds work. like a utopian place for a writer to write. Is what it sounds it like. It will hopefully uh, serve me well uh, to roam the wasteland after the coming apocalypse. <laughs> Christopher Brown, we need to leave it there. Thank you so much for being with us. The book is Tropic of Kansas. And we want to thank you, the members of our audience, for being with us this week. We hope you enjoy the show. If you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, please visit PellCenter.org, or you can always find us on Facebook and Twitter. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us next time for more Story in the Public Square.